All right. So now we're going to move to some structures that are actually inside the, the typical prokaryotic cell. Again, some of these things will be optional and some of them are going to be found in all prokaryotic cells. Uh, the first of these are the inclusion bodies and we can see a, a bacterial cell, a rod-shaped bacterial cell with a number of structures inside it. These are inclusion bodies and uh, these are readily vi uh, visible under light microscopy. If we have a microorganism that is able to make inclusion bodies, uh, we'll be able to spot them under the light microscope in the lab. Uh, the types of inclusion bodies are, are rather varied. They depend upon the species of the bacteria, but in each case these inclusion bodies are going to be used to store various uh, molecules that the cell might need for some reason or another. Uh, we see that the inclusion bodies in this bacteria are made up of a chemical called poly B hydroxybutyrate. Uh, this is merely a way of uh, storing nutrients for a time when the cell may come into an environment where there's very little nutrients out in the environment. So it's a way for the, the cell to stockpile something that it may use for later. Uh, the next structure that we see inside some cells, another optional s structure, is the endospore. Uh, we'll observe what endospores look like in the very next picture. Uh, we recall from biology one that uh, that one of the properties that all cells have is the process of reproduction, where a cell gets larger over time and at some point it may divide in two and reproduce and two daughter cells are produced. This. In the case of a eukaryotic cell we refer to this process of cellular division uh, at, with the terminology mitosis. Bacteria prokaryotes do not undergo the process of mitosis that we learned about in biology 1. They'll undergo a process called binary fission but the, the end result is still the same where one cell gets larger over time and reproduces and divides into two daughter cells that are identical to the original cell. Uh, superficially, this process of forming an endospore looks very much like the same thing is going on. We start off with one cell and the genome is duplicated to make two copies of the DNA genome in that cell. And if the process were undergoing cellular division, uh, these would divide in two and we'd have two cells at the end of the process. Uh, that's not happening in this case. What's happening in this case is that this cell is responding to something out in the environment. Remember, responding to cues in the environment is one of the things that all cellular systems can do. This cell is going to do something a little bit different in response to the environmental cue. We can see that it undergoes some changes in this cartoon. And down here, beginning in, in step four, uh, something's happening over here on this side of the cell that's not happening over here. We can see that the genome here is gradually getting chopped up over here in a bunch of tiny bits, and it's gone. But the DNA genome over here is getting surrounded by a super thick layer that's called a spore coat. And when this all finishes up, and it takes just about eight hours to go from step one, down to step eight. We formed an endospore at the end of this process. We've gone from one bacterial cell to form one endospore. And so this is very different from the process of cellular division that we drew down here at the bottom. Let's see what an endospore looks like under the microscope. This is a, a picture with using an electron microscope and this basically recapitulates what we saw in the previous picture going from steps one through eight early in the process and then later in the process and very near the end of the process. We can see that this spore coat out here is getting thicker and thicker and thicker. In comparison, there's my peptidoglycan cell wall way over there. Uh, right there. The spore coat much thicker over here. Uh, over here we see in this picture a, a light microscope. We're actually going to be doing this technique in our Bio 230 labs uh, during this semester. We can see these green structures that are found in some but not all of the microorganisms in this slide 
These are the endospores. This is an endospore staining technique. Uh, if we allowed this culture to continue to grow and grow and grow and form more endospores, eventually this would be a field of green and there would be no more pink left because the process of forming an endospore takes just a little bit of time. Well, what are the environmental triggers? Uh, endospores are formed when growth conditions are bad. So it's a mechanism for the cells in this population to be able to survive things when environmental growth conditions are poor. Perhaps nutrients are running out, there's no more nutrition, perhaps it's getting too warm, uh, perhaps it's getting extremely dry. All of these things can be triggers that will form endospores. And what happens is this incredibly tough endospore that's formed here at the end then just waits out until growth conditions become good again. When conditions are good, the endospores germinate and grow again. And scientists have been able to successfully isolate endospores from uh, biological materials where they've been endospores for literally centuries. Uh, they were organisms, bacteria, that were caused to form endospores at some time in the past and they've waited out for hundreds of years until conditions are good again to allow those organisms to grow. Now again, endospores are optional structures made by some species of bacteria but not others and we can actually use the endospore in the microbiology laboratory to help us to understand what a microorganism might be if we're faced with an unknown. Uh, the fact that it's able to make an endospore can give us a clue as to its identity. Now these structures are not optional. These are the ribosomes. And in fact, ribosomes are found in all cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And they have the same basic structure in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We can see this sort of bean-like structure over here, complete 70S ribosome. Eukaryotes also have ribosomes. They don't have a 70S ribosome. They have an 80S ribosome that, that looks very much like this, but is a little bit bigger. Under the microscope, this is an actual microscopic image of, of a bunch of ribosomes on, on a slide. Uh, eukaryotic ones would look relatively similar. Now, even in, in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, ribosomes are doing essentially the same job. They're, they're helping out with the process of protein synthesis. Uh, I think we all remember the process of protein synthesis from biology one. We have a couple of players in it. We have a messenger RNA. We have transfer RNA. And we have ribosomes. And these go to form new proteins through the process of translation. Now, there's a number of antibiotics, and some of these we'll learn about over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, here are some names of them, streptomycin, gentamicin, erythromycin, chloramphenicol. You may recognize the name of some of these antibiotics. What these antibiotics do is they, they block this process. They perhaps break the ribosome or block the process of protein translation. Uh, what happens is, is that no new proteins are made by the ribosomes in cells that are being exposed exposed to these. Uh, what we find is that these drugs will have effects on bacterial cells but not on human cells and this is a great thing because if you were to take one of these drugs for instance streptomycin in order to treat an infection that you might have uh, you wouldn't want the streptomycin to damage your cells. And the reason that streptomycin is going to be specific for attacking the ribosomes of the bacteria, but not your cells, is because, as we said, the ribosomes between eukaryotes, which are you know, human cells, and prokaryotes, bacteria, are going to be a little bit different. So these drugs are actually able to distinguish between the ribosomes of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now, we mentioned this other class of prokaryotic cells very early on in the chapter three discussion. We, we said that prokaryotic cells are composed of two big groups, the bacteria, which we're gonna spend a lot of time on in this course, and the archaea, which look very, very similar under the microscope to, to bacteria. And in fact, they have many of the same structures, but many of these structures that we find, the cell wall, the capsule, uh, 
although they look very similar under the microscope, when we examine how they are actually made, they're actually incredibly different. And it's this difference between them that really hints at the evolutionary distance between archaea and bacteria. It's a number that's on the order of billions of years that although these organisms look incredibly similar to one another uh, by appearance, uh, in fact they are genetically extremely different from one another and archaea and bacteria are as different from each other as they are from us. Uh, here's an example of something that looks the same, but is, in the molecular analysis is extremely different. And this is a structure called a hamus, which is found on the surface of many archaic cells. We can see these little hair-like structures, and, and they, they look like, to me, fimbriae. And in fact, these hamus, or hami, do much the same thing. They, they help to attach. We recall that fimbriae help a bacterial cell to attach, and the hamus also allows it to attach. Well, the fimbriae are, help a bacterial cell to attach simply because they're sticky. The hamus, though, when we look at it under a very high magnification, we can see it looks like a little grappling hook. And so you can imagine that this, this archaic cell has these little grappling hooks that are reaching out, touching, and holding on to something. And so we see structures, the fimbriae and the hami, that look the same and accomplish the same thing, but they do so by an extremely different mechanism. And it's this difference in the actual mechanisms that speaks at the evolutionary divergence of these two different classes of organisms.